He's been determined to be the only player in Libya, but Khalifa Haftar's hopes now seem shattered. Forces loyal to the internationally recognized government are making significant gains. So is Haftar about to lose the war? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Warlord Khalifa Haftar wants to control Libya. His battle to do just that could be reaching a turning point, but not in his favour. He launched his offensive to capture the capital Tripoli more than a year ago. It's where the internationally recognised government is based. Forces loyal to that Government of National Accord, or GNA, say they're regaining ground. They've captured several towns around Tripoli and are advancing towards Tahuna an important base for supporting Haftar's forces. Fighting has intensified in recent weeks despite the spread of COVID-19. That's as countries continue to supply Libya's rival powers with weapons, despite a United Nations arms embargo. Well, the UN has warned all parties that the worsening violence and humanitarian crisis could amount to war crimes. And in a statement on Monday, it called for a ceasefire. This senseless protracted war must stop immediately, it said. UNSINIL renews its call for a humanitarian truce to allow Libyans to prepare for the holy month in peace and the authorities to provide urgently needed services, treat the wounded and address the mounting threat of COVID-19. Well, several attempts have been made to bring peace to Libya in the past few months. Turkey and Russia reached a tentative ceasefire deal in Libya in January. That came after Turkish troops had been deployed to support the inter internationally recognized government, and while Russian private security forces were allegedly fighting alongside Haftar. Libya's Prime Minister Fayez al-Sarraj signed up to that ceasefire a few days later in Moscow, but Haftar abruptly left the talks. A peace conference was then held in Germany's capital, Berlin. Foreign powers backing Libya's two warring sides agreed to respect the United Nations arms embargo. UN-led talks in Geneva between representatives from each side ended without a breakthrough in February. And last month, the UN envoy for Libya, Ghassan Salame, resigned, citing health reasons. So let's bring in our panel for today's discussion. From Rome, we're joined by Claudia Gazzini, a senior analyst on Libya at the International Crisis Group. From Rabat, Nufal Aboud, Executive Director at the Nordic Centre for Conflict Transformation, and from Istanbul, Salah El Bakush, who's a political analyst on Libya and former advisor to the Libyan High Council of State. Welcome to you all. Claudia, let's start with you. Is the tide turning in Libya's war? Uh, there's no doubt that the forces of the Tripoli government, with the help of uh, uh, Turkey and the military equipment that was put on the ground in the last few weeks, have made sizable um, gains on, on the ground. In the last week, we've seen Tripoli-based forces advanced slightly west of the capital and slightly south of the capital. This of course, is a recent change in the balance of power. We're talking only about gains of the past few weeks. So we'll have to see whether, A, the Tripoli forces are able to sustain this. And then if this is the case, then we'll really be able to talk about a change in the tide and what the reactions of the outside powers backing uh, Khalifa Haftar and his forces uh, will be, in the sense that we could be looking at a vicious pattern of escalation and not just a change of balance. Uh, Nufal, uh, what's behind the GNA's success uh, militarily and, and will Tripoli's forces be able to sustain this momentum? Yeah, it's very important when you analyse something like this. The notion of space and time is very important because it gives us an idea about the parties in this uh, war. One of the ideas is that the space that has been gained by the GNA forces backed by the uh, by Turkey uh, and the way it is swept uh, gain of the territories, whether from all the, almost all the cities between Tripoli and Tunisia, and also on the coastal uh, in and also in the west and some of the cities in in the south, in the, the time was very short and the casualties were were not a, a lot. This tells us about 
actually what is really uh, Haftar's forces are about. The idea this is, is that perhaps Haftar is not on the ground. Haftar does not have an organized military, as it was portrayed by the countries that were supporting Haftar's forces. And actually, Haftar is relying on mercenaries, or what we, I can call it investors of war, private investors of war, that shift their allegiance and their positions and their sides according to the financial gains and material gains that they gain from uh, Haftar's, Haftar's uh, backing countries. What I can see here and what can tell us is that relying on mercenaries in these cities uh, shifts and shifts very quickly. And it is shifts also because perhaps there was a decrease on the financial gains that those mercenaries were gaining. So I would think that the uh, forces of the uh, GNA and national courts uh, the, uh, there is a, a UN-backed uh, government and also with the support of Turkey, is actually making momentum gain, uh, gain and sweeping victories. And it will be very, very hard to see a U-turn okay. on the escalation of uh, this war from the Haftar sides. Uh, Salah, uh, picking up on that, to what extent has, has Turkey's intervention made these uh, gains by the GNA possible? Uh, and are those gains going to lead to an end to the war in Libya or to a further escalation? I think the main contribution of Turkey to this uh, uh, effort by the GNA is, uh, uh, is in, the, in the air, where uh, uh, the Turkish help uh, has neutralized uh, Haftar's uh, air superiority and the uh, UAE uh, drones and so on. Uh, and now the uh, on the ground, on the ground, the GNA forces know this area very well, and uh, they have the numbers and they have the experience. I mean, they fought like four wars uh, so far on the same grounds. Uh, uh, their experience uh, against Daesh and Sirte, their experience against Gaddafi's forces, and their experience in the uh, internal clashes uh, within the. Uh, several forces inside the west of Libya. So that was the uh, main uh, Turkish contribution. Uh, maybe some uh, tactical advice was uh, also uh, helpful in there. But uh, I, I think it is important to say that it's a bit too early to judge what's going on until maybe uh, uh, the Tarhuna uh, city uh, fate is uh, determined uh, probably in the next few days. And then we can see maybe a clearer picture of what's going on. Uh, we note also that Haftar's forces are uh, in disarray. Uh, the man hasn't shown up on TV or we haven't heard from him for the last two, three weeks. We don't know what's going on there. Uh, and in the East, uh, uh, his... Uh, his uh, superiority, his reputation, his stature is being dimensioned every, uh, every day with these uh, advances by the GNA. Uh, Claudia, can the GNA now set the parameters of the peace process? Is it yet in a position to do that? Well, I think the, the first question to ask is if it's willing to set the parameters of the peace process. In my conversations uh, with my friends and interlocutors in Tripoli, uh, they seem to suggest that it's still premature to talk about conditions for a ceasefire, that the offensive is still ongoing. As Mr. Salah said uh, before me, the offensive against this stronghold, Haftar stronghold outside Tripoli, the city of Tarahuna, is ongoing. What will happen with that town is still up in the air. And whether, again, GNA forces will be able to sustain their positions is an open question. So there's actually no talk for the time being about uh, setting out conditions uh, from the GNA side. And I must say, even from the uh, Eastern side, the Haftar-led forces, there is a complete denial on their need to engage on a peace process. But it must be said, and we should remember, that when Turkey decided to intervene uh, on the side of the GNA forces, it said, uh, they said in Ankara that their purpose was to rebalance the power on the ground in order to enable uh, a peace process. So now there is also a certain moral burden on the outside backers of the GNA to ensure that 
you know, once we've gone beyond this initial phase of a counteroffensive, that the target remain that of a peace process that has to still be in the cards. It's not there yet. Uh, I want to talk about, about the backers, both the GNA and of uh, Haftar's forces in just a moment. But first, uh, Nufal, I want to pick up on, on something that, that you, you alluded to or you, 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 you touched upon in your, in your first answer. Uh, what do the GNA's gains tell us about Haftar's fighting force and its competence, the fact that they've been swept aside by the forces of the GNA in, in so many parts of, uh, of, of northern Libya? Yeah, like I said, you know, the time in which uh, the GNA gained the uh, gained back the territories and uh, the size of uh, the territories is quite large. Uh, this tells us about uh, the construct of how Haftar and Haftar's forces are has been in, indirectly, or if you want to say even directly, deconstructed by this uh, swept gain uh, from the GNA. Uh, like it was mentioned, uh, Haftar disappeared now for the last three weeks. Um, we don't, it, it was portrayed as having an organized military, which is not the case, but his reliance on, on mercenaries uh, has, and now is very visible, and you can't gain war only based on uh, mercenaries. Uh, another point that I would like to, to mention here is about the backup from Turkey. This is not new in Tripoli uh, and in Libya in general. This is almost a repeat of the history uh, in relation to Malta and how the order of St. John that was representing the Romans at that time has invaded Tripoli. And there was so many atrocities uh, among Libyans, civilians, who these Libyan civilians went to Turkey, to the Ottoman Empire at that time uh, for Empire uh, Suleiman asking for protection and intervention. So there is a history of, or some kind of romanticism between Turkey backing up Libyans and especially in relation to Tripoli. Uh, so the idea of where half the question that should be is that where is the structure of Hafsar military right now? And that the answer to this question will tell us how the future should look like in the in the country. Uh, uh, Claudia, before, before I, I go back to Salah, do you, do you just want to comment on, on that? I saw you smile and roll your eyes there at one point. Well, I mean, I just find it very easy to reach back five centuries in, in history uh, in order to make uh, comparisons. Uh, I mean, the Turkish intervention opened uh, uh, according to uh, Turkish uh, law, uh, legitimate, uh, um, uh, not according to other parameters, international parameters, uh, is a fact in, in itself. Of course, Turkish authorities like to uh, tap into the, you know, the Ottoman rhetoric, the Ottoman history uh, of Turkey and portray themselves, and we hear this in authorities in Ankara as the saviors of, uh, uh, of Libya in part because of this Ottoman heritage, and therefore they have a duty to, to intervene to save what were originally uh, Ottoman uh, Libyans. But it's a, uh, it's a dangerous uh, sort of path to take that of historical analogies. But I wanted to raise one, one issue. When, when, when I hear often talk about uh, the mercenaries in, in uh, the Haftar forces, ranks, that's, there's no doubt that they'd be using um, Russian uh, private contractors, uh, Sudanese fighters, Darfurian, and so on. But let's not forget, and let's also remember that um, uh, the Tripoli forces at the moment in the past, past few months have been heavily reliant on another sort of uh, mercenary force, which are the Syrian forces provided uh, through Turkey um, that now range in the thousands. And it is undeniable that they have contributed uh, to this uh, new wave or reverse of, of the tide uh, in the conflict around Tripoli. So mercenaries are present in Libya on both sides of the conflict. Uh, Salah, to what extent uh, is, is Turkey and the UAE uh, key to what happens next in this conflict? No, I, I think what Claudia is, uh, uh, is saying here is what we've been hearing from the Europeans now that the Turks uh, are supporting the Libyans. Everybody is raising hell about it, and Turkish mercenaries and so on, and thousands of them, and they were heavily used. They were not heavily, and I don't think there are any evidence that can be shown 
by Claudia or anybody else that uh, mercenaries were used in cleaning, clearing the coastal highway of Libya, uh, including the cities of Surma, Sobrata, Ragdalin, Najelet, Zoltan, and so on. There are no evidence whatsoever that uh, uh, mercenaries were used. Now, nobody talked, the Europeans, nobody, none of them talked about what the UAE is doing in Libya, what the Saudis are doing in Libya, what the Egyptians are doing in Libya. Now that when, when the Russians and the Turks got in, everybody raised hell about it. And that shows you the, uh, I mean, the duplicity of the Europeans and this hypocrisy of, uh, uh, the hypocrisy of their position. Nobody thought, I mean, the, the UAE, since the Berlin conference, have sent tons of equipment to uh, Haftar. They, they, they have a, an air base in the east of Libya they used to bomb uh, the west of Libya. Nobody talked about that. The Europeans are, 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 uh, talked and they convened the Berlin conference once they saw the Turks and the Russians are in. That's the only reason. And now they are initiating this irony uh, 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 mission in the Mediterranean to help Haftar and help the Emiratis and try to stop the Turks. That's what the whole thing is about. And until we see a balanced and non-hypocritical position from the Europeans, I think the, uh, uh, the Libyans and the GNA will continue and we will not listen to anything that the Europeans uh, are going to say because they have nothing to offer. They, have, uh, they are broken, they are uh, uh, disunited, and they, are not, okay. uh, 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 they have no position in the conflict uh, uh, now. Claudia, how, how heavily involved in the conflict is, is the UAE? Why is it not subject to the same criticism uh, as Turkey and, and Russia for being so? No, I mean, we've, we've all known that the UAE is uh, directly involved in the Libya conflict. It's nothing new. They started helping Haftar uh, build up his forces in eastern Libya way back in 2014 and 2015. Uh, also, the Egyptians have played a key role in, in helping this military uh, force, which originally numbered just a few hundred people and now has thousands uh, of people and um, uh, a parallel unrecognized government uh, backing it in eastern Libya. It's documented in a number of uh, UN panel of experts reports. So it's widely known, uh, and especially since the outbreak of hostilities last April, at the beginning of this war uh, in Tripoli, it was widely known that the UAE was providing um, armed drones in support of Haftar forces. Um, uh, Salah is right to say that there's been a, more, a greater outcry about foreign, the presence of foreign forces in Libya since uh, Russia has been more visible. This is late 2019, Russian uh, uh, security forces have been on the ground with uh, with Haftar and also since uh, Turkey decided to intervene. But I think we've all known of the role of the Emirati um, uh, forces. It's an indirect role. It's a role mainly of the provision uh, of uh, equipment, not forces on the ground, but they are also bankrolling uh, Haftar forces. Of course, the focus of the UN and I would say a number of European countries in approaching the Libya conflict was to take, um, uh, take on board the fact that increasingly more and more countries, more and more forces are jumping into the Libya chaos or the Libya conflict for their own national strategic interests and using uh, Libyan factions to pursue those interests. So okay. European approach okay. and UN approach was to say, let's stop foreign intervention. Uh, Nufal, I'll come to you in just a moment. But first, Salah, uh, do, you, do you want to come back on, on what we just heard then? I wonder what, what this no, conflict no. In, in Libya would look like without the UAE, if it was somehow stopped uh, from violating arms embargoes and, 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 uh, and directives from the UN. Look, is, is there anything more ridiculous than the Europeans joining the UAE in several declaration statement joint statements calling saying that there is no political there is no military solution and they are asking all everybody to uh, uh, adhere to a ceasefire with uh, 
they are signing these statements with the UAE. I mean, I mean, how ridiculous is that? And yes, Claudia says that, yeah, every, it's widely known. Well, it's widely known to the Brits and the French and the Germans and the Italians what the UAE is doing. But th th that doesn't stop them from signing this ridiculous statement, joint statements, calling for a political solution. I mean, the political solution was 10 days away when Haftar, with the help of the Emiratis and the French, attacked Tripoli while Mr. Guterres was in town. So everybody talks about there is no uh, uh, military solution and there is a political solution and so on. But I think the situation is going the way Syria is going. Everybody was saying that there is no military solution and it ends up with a military solution. So uh, I, I think until everybody gets their act together and they start calling a spade a spade, there will be no uh, uh, political solution. There will be no political solution with Haftar. Haftar has shown his total contempt for any political solution at every turn. Nufal, uh, has the fact that Haftar's allies have been distracted by the coronavirus pandemic helped the GNA militarily and weakened Haftar's forces? Is there any international appetite right now, given the pandemic, to find an internationally mediated political solution to Libya's conflict? Yeah, the circumstances of the pandemic have shifted a little bit the position of the uh, allies of who support uh, Haftar uh, because of the coronavirus that is going around in their own countries and the more and more, you know, the look over the spending of uh, the money on external wars. Uh, that, of course, we will see even more shifting, in my opinion, uh, on the position on, on uh, those who support Haftar when the pandemic hit heavily the forces of Haftar, uh, about 15 or 20 percent of them, if they are affected by the coronavirus, we would definitely see uh, a, a, a backup cough of the, these forces and these mercenaries in relation to the established government of the GNA that was actually, that was recognized by the UN. And here I would like to come back to what solution for Libya. Uh, I was asked the question, what framework we want to resolve the, the, the crisis in Libya? There was one that was proposed under the UN. Uh, it was the agreement at Sherat in Morocco that is through which the GNA was established uh, in 2015, in December 17, 2015. Since then, there was opposition to the framework of the UN. Uh, would we want to go on a political solution under the framework of the UN, uh, or are we going somewhere with the framework of private uh, interests of uh, countries or even the private interests of the EU? I think with, you know, for the interests of the Libyan people, there is an international institution that is responsible for international peace and security, which is the UN. Uh, right. Are we going anywhere with okay. Haftar? I don't think so. But I think the GNA, uh, whether with or without the pandemic, uh, they have more solid uh, credibility to be able to work with and find a political solution within the premises of the UN, not in the territory of Libya. And uh, because it's only the casualties are mostly the civilians. So I think the momentum is going higher for uh, the framework that was proposed uh, under the agreement of Sherat in Morocco. OK, there, I'm afraid we must end it. Many thanks indeed uh, to you all for being with us. Claudia Gazzini, uh, Nufal Aboud and Salah El Bakush. Uh, and thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion on Libya, join us at our Facebook page, You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for being with us. I'll see you again. Bye for now.